Hello and welcome to episode nine of this Inspire 2020 Visionary Leader chat series. I'm really delighted to be joined today by uh, Eduardo Braseño, co-founder and CEO of Mindset Works. Hi, Eduardo. It's great to, to, to have you here. Hi, Simon. Great to be here. Thanks for having uh, me here. It's great to see you. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, um, so, so you're, you're co-founder with Carol Dweck and uh, Lisa Black, Blackwell of, of the business. You're also a keynote speaker, highly in demand, TED, Tech, uh, TEDx, uh, TED Talk speaker. I think you've been one of the most in demand speakers in your area. And the whole area of mindset is, a, is an area of deep fascination and interest for me. You know, I do a lot of work around business, leadership, brand and personal growth. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk to you over the next half an hour about, about your views on mindset. And, um, but before we do that, maybe just if you can just give the, the, the viewers and the listeners just a three to five minute overview of you, your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. OK, uh, so I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, and I never thought that I would leave the country or, or this, the city that I lived in. Everybody that I ever met. Uh, always stayed who was there, who always stayed uh, living there for their whole life. But when I was in high school, my father got transferred for two years to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I ended up finishing high school there, uh, junior and senior year. And that completely changed my life uh, because the, the school that I, that I joined had, uh, uh, you could choose classes, which was something that was new to me. And it seemed like a really exciting thing where I could explore topics. In, in my school in Venezuela, you would sit in the same chair for the whole year and teachers mm -hmm. would come in and out of, this, of the classroom and would mainly lecture at you. So I, was, I thought learning and school was boring and I was a mediocre student. I was fine, but I didn't apply myself. And so when I went to the US, I, I kind of reconnected with that love of learning. Yeah. Um, and I also, it gave me an opportunity to kind of start anew and, uh, and, and if I applied myself, I got good grades, maybe I could go to a good school, a good university, which yeah. I did. And I ended up uh, staying in junior year in my school. It was all about learning about colleges and applying to college. So I ended up staying in school here in the U.S. because I got excited about uh, the University of Pennsylvania, which I went to. Yeah. And then when I went there... I continued applying myself and doing what I thought I was supposed to do and what I thought would open up options and opportunities for me in the future. So I studied, um, I studied subjects that I was not passionate about, but I thought were the subjects that I was supposed to study. I yeah. studied chemical engineering and finance. And then when I graduated, I went to the best job I could find, which was in Wall Street. I, I went and worked in investment banking. Uh, in all these, it was exciting for somebody from Venezuela who thought would never live outside the country to be living in New York City, yeah. and working in this like multi-million dollar transactions with these huge com 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 uh, companies and CEOs. Yeah. And I kept doing what I thought, you know, what I was supposed to be doing. I joined the venture capital arm of the investment bank and moved to Silicon Valley to invest in technology companies. Yeah. Uh, this was at the dot-com boom. And things were really exciting and prosperous. And then uh, the dot-com crash uh, happened. And it was really interesting for me to see how uh, kind of the dark side of humanity that came with everything being bleak, um, yeah. a lot of layoffs, a lot of people being fired, a lot of fights between entrepreneurs and investors and between yeah investors and kind of investors fully diluting each other and along with all that kind of bleakness um, and people being in a really bad mood all day yeah uh, i also realized that i wasn't doing something that was meaningful to me that i felt was making an impact and impacting other people's lives because yeah. i saw some investors who were really value added they had a lot of wisdom a lot of experience and could really guide the ceos but i was sitting on boards doing supposed to do the same thing advising ceos and i i didn't feel authentic i felt like i had to be somebody else pretend yeah. to know things that i didn't know and just basically parrot what other people said yeah uh, so that created a lot of stress for me i, I got physically sick mm -hmm. and uh, I, I developed a significant repetitive strain injury I, I stopped having the ability to use my hands to be, to do very basic things like wow. brush my 
deeper drive, uh, use the computer. And so I had to go on a health journey for several years of yeah. first trying to figure out what I had and, and how I had to treat myself and, and yeah. change my lifestyle. And part of that, I, I, I developed a sense of mortality. My, my life was not in danger, but yeah. I, I, I lost my ability to use my hands and I met people along the way who had the same condition, who couldn't use the computer for more than 10 minutes a day. And I didn't know how to do anything without my hands or without a computer. So that was very scary for me. I was in my late 20s. Yeah. And I, I decided that I had to do something that was meaningful to me, that was going to make an impact now. So I went to grad school to do that, interested in social entrepreneurship and also interested in education. My wife had become a teacher yeah. and I had learned through education through her. And over there, I explored, I, I, I explored several opportunities in social entrepreneurship. And I was introduced to Carol Dweck, who was a professor there at Stanford. Yeah. Um, and she was looking for somebody to partner with to bring growth mindset to the world. Uh, wow. So we met, we got to know each other, we talked about a vision, yeah. and uh, we co-founded Mindset Works 12 years ago, and that's what, what I've been devoted since. Wow. Um, and it's been, it's been a great, a great start of a journey, and it's been a great journey since. Wow, wow. And I, I, I can imagine that the, the journey ahead could just go in so many different directions. And uh, it's interesting, you know, because... You know, I've had a similar journey. I started life, I don't know whether you know, as a corporate lawyer uh, in the UK and here. I worked in the States for a couple of tech companies. And while law was a great discipline, I never felt, and I've had this conversation with a couple of the previous guests on the show, I never felt fully authentic. You know, it was like I was, it's like there were two versions of me. There was the, the, the cool corporate version, but there was the real Simon, you know, and uh so, you know, today, so I'm no longer a corporate lawyer. Today, I'm my own boss. I do co coaching, consulting, lecturing, training, and I love it. And um, I feel that I've sort of sh got rid of that inauthentic, you know, that inauthentic, I must try and become, you know, must try and put on this brave appearance me. And I'm just me. And, and I have to admit that, you know, the things that have unfolded for me as a result of doing, and it takes bravery to do that, you know, because so many people hide behind this facade, but, but amazing things have opened up for me. I've met amazing people. I'm doing this, this, this series. And, um, but I think, I think a lot of people need to hear the stories that, that you and I tell around this. Cause I think a lot of, and a lot of particularly men, I think as well are scared of showing their vulnerability, you know? And, um, and I think, one of my other guests talked about um, happiness or contentedness is the other side of fear. You know, I think we do need to go through pain barriers. So, um, so in terms of mindset, the whole area, I don't even know where to start. I mean, it's a massive area, but, but in terms of mindset works, it, it could, it, could you explain exactly what the company does and what, what your rationale is, what your purpose is in a, in a nutshell? Sure, yeah. So our purpose is to help enable a more learning-oriented world, to create a world where both people are curious about growing themselves, learning about the world, yeah. improving, and that organizations are set up in a way that allow organizations and individuals to do that. And so we started 12 years ago uh, with an initial focus on education and schools because we see schools as the core center of society that yeah. brings a lot of people in society together, kind of parents, teachers, students, yeah. and the next generations. And, uh, and so we started there and um, we help teachers, educators, school leaders, district leaders, learn about growth mindset, what it is, why it's important, and what the implications are for everything that we do in school. Yeah. Um, and we've made a lot of progress. First, we, we made a lot of progress in education. There's uh, most teachers know what growth mindset is and, and, yeah. uh, and, and they try to implement it. They see it as a positive thing that they want. There's yeah. still a lot of work to be done in terms of clarity of you know, what exactly it is, what, exa what the ramifications are, how do we put it into practice. There's, there's a lot yeah. of work ahead, but there's been a lot of excitement yeah. and also great practice from, from, from some districts and schools and, and educators. Um, yeah. and then uh, a few years later, there, we've started seeing more interest from businesses who wanted to drive continuous improvement and innovation, create a more yeah. learning oriented culture and systems where there's more psychological safe, safety, where people feel more like they can cr take more sensible risks, like they yeah. can solicit feedback, they can share what they're working on. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, it makes companies 
more adaptive to a fast changing world and also more able to drive change. And I think that the yeah. strongest organizations are those that drive change. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've been doing a lot of work now with companies that have spent most of my time in the last few years working with business leaders, yeah. uh, helping them kind of learn about growth mindset. Because there's also, there's, there's more awareness of growth mindset, but there's also lack of clarity. You know, sometimes people think of growth mindset as anything that's positive and fixed mindset as anything that's negative. Yeah. Or they think about growth mindset as positive mindset. So kind of understanding what it is and what the implications are for business yeah. and for business leadership uh, is, is a lot of the work that I do. Uh, you know, it's a massive area and, uh, you know, I, I, I work, in fact, you know, I'm running a program, I'm starting tomorrow through the Irish government funded program and it's called um, Building Your Confidence to Rebalance Your Business. And I don't get into the deep area of growth mindset, but we do talk about some of the aspects and, you know, I don't know whether, I don't, I don't know what the situation is like in the States, but over here in Europe, you know, as a result of what we're going through with the, with the pandemic, there's an awful lot of business leaders, SME, small business leaders, but also senior executives who are questioning where they're at and how they pivot or to what extent they should pivot their business, how fast they should move, should they spend money on this or spend money on that. And so building your confidence, building your confidence to, to move forward is a real, really important area for, for business leaders. And in, in your experience, does that is that a is that a core component of the whole area of mindset? Do, do a lot of people feel that they have this imposter syndrome that they can't fully stretch themselves to 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 to, to embrace a growth mindset? Do, do people feel enclosed in their confidence? In your experience, so confidence and mindset definitely have a strong connection, uh, and and it's interesting to think about what we mean by confidence. Sometimes we think about confidence as something that means that you're sure that you are right. To be yeah. confident means that you're sure that you're right. Uh, but that's, that's a very brittle sort of confidence uh, yeah. because uh, first of all, nobody knows everything and the world's always changing. So our assumptions exactly. are always changing. Um, yeah. And so confidence in that we, that we are doing a good thing, a right thing in terms of doing smart experiments and learning from them and iterating and soliciting feedback and, li and, and listening to customers and trying things like that's a different sort of customer of confidence yeah. that is uh, a lot more resilient and that leads to more learning oriented behaviors. So for mm. example, it, just to go to some of the research, if it, some of the research has shown that if you tell kids you're so smart, which we often do to increase their confidence, we want to convince them that they're smart and we think that if they are convinced that they're smart, then they'll be confident. And so what happens when they do something right and correctly and you say, you're so smart, you're such yeah. a natural, they might feel good about themselves at that moment. They might feel confident and say, I am smart. But yeah. the deeper lesson that That's they are right. learning is that the reason people succeed is because they're smart, right? And, and some people are smart, some people are not smart. Yeah. And what a growth mindset is to define it, uh, a growth mindset is the understanding that anybody can get better or smarter or more capable versus yeah. a fixed mindset, which is seeing our human qualities or abilities as fixed as, you know, people are either smart or not smart, or they're, That's right. you know, they are uh, empathetic or not empathetic rather yeah. than everybody can become more empathetic or everybody can become smarter or more thoughtful. Yeah. And so when we tell kids you're so smart, their confidence goes up in the short term while they are succeeding, while they're doing things they already know how to do in their comfort zone, when they're doing things quickly and, and without mistakes yeah. and yeah. without effort. But when they encounter struggle, when they encounter harder things, then they say, I'm not this smart, right? So their confidence drops really quickly. Yeah. As opposed to kind of talking about our behaviors, our strategies, what we're trying, what we're learning, what we're thinking along the way. Yeah. Uh, and, and then we reinforce the idea that we can all improve and what are the behaviors that we want to all be doing. Yeah. And that leads to confidence in, in what we're doing, right? And that we can be effective learners and continue yeah. to get better over time, which yeah. is a more resilient type of confidence. So when you go back to the to the business leadership, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty right now with a yeah. fast changing world. Um, if we think that we have to do something that has to be right and work right, right away, that can be debilitating. That can feel, make us feel like, you know, like deer in, in headlights. Uh, but if we 
if we try to do the smartest thing we can, right, and, yeah. and have confidence that we will learn along the way, we'll take yeah. certain experiments, learn from them, you know, try to take, uh, to, to take risks that are more measured, that are not going to, uh, yeah. to, to lead the company to, to go out of business if they don't fall, if, if possible. Yeah. Um, but but that you're doing smart things along the way, and you will learn along the way, and gets gets better along the way. Yeah. That's a more uh, that allows you to take more action and to be able to uh, improve along the way. That's that's really well explained, and it's very poignant because I'm in the middle of reading Carol's book Mindset, and and I didn't really realize that, you know, I didn't fully realize the difference. And I you know I, this is a large part of the work that I do with leaders and organizations. The difference between uh, the, you mentioned the word brittle, right? And that's a very good word. And so, you know, I think one of the questions she asked at the, at the beginning of the, near the beginning of the book is, um, you know, she gives you a test on, on your intelligence and there's four questions and, you know, can you improve your intelligence? Is your intelligence fixed? And initially I thought, well, of course, everybody's intelligence is fixed. You know, your intelligence is what it, what it is when you're 18. So it's going to be the same when you're six, 80, you know, but but really thinking it through and reading the book and, and reflecting on my own life, you know, IQ is one small part of intelligence. You know, there's social intelligence, there's all sorts of intelligence. And of course it changes and morphs through life. So when you talk about, you know, saying to a kid, you're smart, it might be great at that point, but it can actually create a self-limiting brittleness. I, I hadn't realized all of that until I dug into this. And I don't think, I don't hear enough people talking about this. You know, I think there's just this presumption that you just throw out the words like you're smart and you're great, but I don't think people realize, well, what if somebody who's, who you, you say that to doesn't succeed, what are they going to fall back onto? They're going to fall back onto negativity potentially, you know? So there's a fine line between praising, but also limiting. Would you agree with that? There's a fine line, isn't there? Yeah. So the, the other problem, not only is if, if they struggle, but if, if they believe that they're smart and they're natural, they're also not going to be working to get better. Like, for Absolutely. example, uh, we sometimes might tell people, you're such a natural leader, right? You're a natural leader. That's something that's used a lot. Yeah. Uh, people might get the impression that you either have it in you or you don't, and that leadership is not something that you work at and develop over time, right? Yeah. So there's a difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset about leadership. Uh, yeah. So, so it's not just, yes, it is when things get hard, but it's also just the fact that we might not be working on continuing to improve ourselves over time in terms of praise. Um, so, so what the, what Carol Dweck's research shows and a lot of other people's research now is that when we praise kind of behaviors rather than put labels on people that that leads um, more reinforcement of the behaviors and yeah. uh, and of a growth mindset if the behaviors are learning oriented uh, yeah. rather than having people think about themselves as labels as I am X and I'm never going to change Absolutely. Um, but but also in 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 this dialogue so yeah there's a lot of nuance to growth mindset that that yeah. it is you need to kind of peel the onion and work on it over time it's not something that is it, it seems like something that is easily understood from one day to the other or like right in a sense that, oh yeah right. I've always had a growth mindset but when you start kind of diving into it there's a lot of nuance to it and and one of the things that people get uh, uh, confused about uh, or or that, that that leads to misunderstanding is is that all we should do is praise because there's some powerful powerful research that has shown two different types of praise and the different mindsets and behaviors that it leads to but then and so and, and sometimes we've made the mistake of of highlighting that research too much because yeah. it it highlights something that is against what a lot of people do, which is praise kids for being smart. Um, but so, so it leads people to, under, to, to start understanding that there's a lot of nuance to this. But, but also, we can do too much praise of anything. You know, we don't want kids to be doing whatever they're doing because they will get praise or anybody else. Yeah. You know, we can ask uh, them questions that lead them to reflect. We can ask them for their opinions. We can ask them yeah. for their feedback. We can have conversations that are authentic to your earlier point. Uh, yeah. so, so, but the key is to have conversations that have the underlying assumption that we can all continue to develop ourselves. 
there's also the whole area of culture. So, you know, I do quite a lot of work in, uh, in, in the, you know, I work for a number of aviation finance type companies and, you know, they would have 300 employees here in Dublin from 70 different cultures, right? And I'm, I'm just co-launching a program around cultural cohesion to increase productivity in organizations. And it makes me think that, you know, I've lived in the States, right? So I lived, I worked in Silicon Valley for a bit and I'm generalizing here, stereotypes. So I'm being very careful with, I'm giving myself a rider here, but generally the American culture is very, very much about praise, right? Whereas I've also lived for 10 years in Australia and the, they, have a, they have a syndrome in Australia called the tall, tall poppy syndrome. So if you, if you rise too high, people like to, to cut you down a little bit because you're getting too big for your boots, you know, and, which is kind of the opposite of the American. And then I live here in Ireland, which is somewhere between the American and the Australian and then the UK. I've lived there, which is very much stiff upper lip. And, and I'm just thinking how all that fe feeds into this. So, so what we've discussed up to now, right? Then you have, I mean, do we have like 250 different cultural overlays on this stuff, depending on which culture you're in? How, do, how does all that work? Yeah, so, so mindsets are beliefs, right? Is the growth mindset is the belief I can get better. Fixed mindset is the belief that I'm set the way I am. Yeah. And we, we learn our beliefs from our observations of the world, from, especially from our observations of other people. Yeah. Um, but so to your point about culture, the culture, how people talk, how people behave, the rituals that they engage in, that affects our beliefs and our mindset and what we do. Yeah. And, and so, yes, the culture is really, really important. We can think about our family culture. Like we talked about how parents praise kids. We can yeah. talk about the culture in our town or in our country or yeah. in our company. Right. Yeah. And to your point about cohesiveness, if we create companies that have a strong, cohesive culture or teams, you know, it doesn't have to be at the company level. That is the most powerful thing for the company. But yeah. if you have if you're part of a team that has a strong culture and a strong culture cohesion, um, you can you can get clear about what's important in that team and to be part of that team and behave accordingly. So yeah. for us as leaders, whether you're an individual contributor or a leader, we can be leaders in, in leading a culture. Yeah. Um, and but it is definitely something to be thinking about is what what are the things that we say and do on a daily basis as well as our systems then what is the system support uh in order to continue to drive innovation continuous improvement the understanding that we can always get better yeah what well, one really you interesting point about cultures sorry but um the, in terms of different countries and different um uh different parts of the world do have different cultures and that does have uh, an effect on mindset as well as the media you know the kid, kids yeah. or adults uh, watch movies they watch cartoons and those also have messages so all of that affects yeah. the yeah. and of course i suppose it morphs over time as well i suppose the the, the archetypal american all american culture of the 1950s is probably very different to what it is today you know and uh, the, the, uh, something that came out of a conversation you know i'm working with a business consultant from Israel. He's part, there's a team of three of us from Israel and uh, another consultant here from Ireland. And I'm from an English family, but I lived in Australia. So there's a bit of a cultural mix between the three of us. And one thing that I never really realized was, so I'm, I'm a white uh, Anglo-Saxon, middle-aged, middle-class guy, right? And I've worked in the corporate world for American tech companies and in Australia, I, were, I was the CEO of an American company in Australia. I never fully realized that if you weren't naturally native English speaking, right? This came from the expert in the team who is a, a, a cultural language communication ex, uh, expert that you're, you have to work. And this would be an interesting question to you coming from Venezuela, right? That, that she, 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 talking to her clients, you have to almost work twice as hard to integrate into an organization. So because the natural English speaking person just assumes that the non-natural English speaking person communicates as efficiently in English. Right. But, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the case. Right. So, yeah. so what do you think about that? The effect of the impact of language on the way that uh, your, your mindset and in turn more particularly on the way that you um, are perceived by others, your mindset is perceived by others that must have an impact. Yeah. So, we have so many non-conscious biases and, and when we're in a company, we're working with colleagues, 
part of what our non-conscious is doing is assessing them, assessing yep. what they're good at, you know, yep. what, 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 what value they can bring to the team. And some of, one of the mistakes that our brain makes is that it confuses if somebody has more trouble communicating, we might believe that yep. they are not as good as critical thinking or at other yep. cognitive skills yep. because what we are hearing you know, is we think it's a, is a, is a, is a, is a, as accurate representation. But they, as you're saying, they might, they might have more challenges in communicating because they have less yeah. vocabulary, they have to exactly. be thinking more about the, um, the other language. Uh, so yeah, this happens a lot in schools where um, uh, English language learners might come into a school and not be able to communicate very well. And then the teacher yeah. thinks that they, their intelligence is low in math and reading and writing and everything else oh, yeah. uh, when they might actually have excelled in their native language and they might uh, in those things, um, but they might have a, a language challenge. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also the, the, the bilingual nature, you know, when somebody speaks several languages, as a lot of people in Europe do, that comes with a lot of cognitive advantages and strengths as well. Yeah. Uh, and so sometimes we don't, we don't see that either. Yeah, no, it's a massive area. And back, back so, so in terms of organizations and leaders and, you know, what I, I just, I've written and I've done podcasts on what's currently happening with this pandemic. And, you know, a bit like World War II, there was an acceleration in innovation. And in the space race, there was an acceleration as well. And I'm convinced, uh, you know, I've written for the Irish Tech News and I, I spoke to Ted Rubin, who's the CMO of Photify based over in Florida and convinced that there is going to be an acceleration in certain technologies. And I think Gartner have said that um, people re working remotely have in will increase from 30% to 48%. And um, how, how, how do you think the whole changing business landscape with more people working at home sitting in front of screens like this, right? And not actually shaking hands or embracing probably for a few years. Will that have an impact on the whole area of mindset? The fact that we're all living in a more remote world for the foreseeable future. Well, I would say that the companies and individuals that have a more growth mindset culture and systems are going to thrive more in a fast changing world that's being disrupted. Yeah, yeah. And for individuals that are be work, going to be working more remotely and in some cases with a lot more freedom and degrees of freedom yeah. than the individuals that are, um, that are wanting to improve themselves to learn how to work effectively in different ways, but also that have more intrinsic motivation are yep. going to make the most out of that world rather than individuals who are kind of feel like they need to be told exactly what to do when uh, they're going to, they might struggle more, you know, when, when there isn't somebody telling them what to do right next to them. Uh, and so that might lead people to go through some of that kind of fear and tough times that you talked about at the very beginning of our conversation yeah. that might help them come to a better place, you know, through the struggle. Uh, but I do think that the, the organizations and individuals that are more learning oriented, improvement oriented, innovation oriented are yeah. better positioned to, 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 to thrive in these fast changing times. That, that's really interesting because, you know, as we wrap up the last five minutes or so, I, I'm, I'm reflecting very much on me, right? It's a, it's a, a lot of people are using this period as a period of self-reflection, right? And reading Carol's book and doing various and doing this series as well, I've realized that I've been blessed to have a growth mindset myself, right? Even though I didn't really realize I had, you know, and looking back through my career, I've managed to reinvent myself. I've been a corporate lawyer then I worked for tech companies and then I became a CEO and then now I do my own stuff and I, you know, I'm constantly reinventing and I've written books and, um, and, and nothing really seems to challenge me. I sort of grasp a, a grasp, a, a project and run with it. And, and, and I've also, I've always embraced constructive criticism. I remember having bosses being constructively critical of me and I don't remember feeling I remember feeling more concerned when I was being ignored than when I was being criticized. And, um, and, and then bang up today, you know, that the last three months in lockdown over here in Ireland, I've used it. I've probably done more digital catch up work than I had in the previous three years, you know, 
online programs, et cetera, et cetera. And talking to a lot of my friends and colleagues, I think a lot of people are using this period to reflect. And I think people are realizing they're a lot more resilient and they had more of a growth mindset than they realized. And it, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you think people are reflecting and re using this as a period to, to realize that they have more in them that they, than they thought? Are you seeing that? I do think a lot of people are reflecting and being forced to be in sometimes what people feel as an uncomfortable situation and yeah. figure out a way to get go about it. And yeah. I think a lot of people who have been successful in business, like, like yourself, um, can find a lot of those kind of growth mindset elements of themselves that have, where they have kind of learned and, and grown over time. Yeah. I think a lot of people then, uh, I, would, I would encourage a lot of people to think about whether they are making their learning orientation, their learning process visible to the people that they lead and to their coworkers. You, you said you were, because when you're saying, I'm soliciting feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. You're saying, I'm a learner, I want to learn from you, I want to get always, better. Always, always. Yeah. What, I, what I see from a lot of leaders is that they feel that when they become senior, they're expected, they feel like they're expected to have the answers and yeah. to have to make the decisions that are correct. Yeah. And maybe they might feel like they are learners behind curtains, right? You know, in their office, in their commute yeah. back home or at home, but other people don't see them that way. You know, they see them as people who are knowers, not learners. Yeah. And so something that I would encourage people to reflect on is whether other people see you as learners, because that's how to build a learning oriented culture is when we're learning together, not on our own. And I, I, I guess that's, that, that's a fine balance though, because if you're an inspirer and an inspirer, a leader in an organization, you have to have followers. And so people look for a certain magnetism and they, they want to feel a certain aura about you that you can influence as the leader, others to follow you. But also, but I do think you need to be authentic. So I don't think for me, I don't think there's any harm. I'm, I'm one of the best, CEOs I ever worked for was a guy called a Belgium guy called Wim Rolance, and he was CEO of a Silicon Valley based tech company called Xilinx an amazing they make the chips for mobile phones and, and, and various other technologies and he would I mean highly skilled highly articulate a great leader right but but he would rotate his desk around the big campus there in in um, in San Jose, right? And, and, and so he was very humble, right? So people loved him because they followed him and he was very articulate in knowledge, but, it, but he lacked misguided ego. So is what you're saying that, that great leaders can have people follow them, but also appear to be slightly vulnerable as well? Is that what you're saying? It, it's Cer not certainly, yes, yeah. certainly. And, and cool. Good. I think about um, Olympic gold medalists who are the best in the world, they wake yeah. up the next day and they work on what they can improve, right? They work yeah. on their weaknesses. They work on what they, they haven't mastered yet. And yeah. I, that's what I see the greatest CEOs doing is they are fantastic. They're very, very competent. Yeah, they yeah. are super thoughtful, uh, but they also continue to, to, to get better. Um, and and it, it, it is something that people admire them for because they are so good and they, can, they continue to, to get better and to... And to, yeah. to to model the way for the whole organization to continue to get better. Perfect, perfect. So just just, just wrapping up, um, Eduardo. So if, if you were going to be talking to uh, you know a, a young, say in the twenties, aspiring leader, right? So they, they they've got a pathway mapped out for them in an organization. What two or three words of wisdom would you whisper them to them in terms of how they could calibrate or develop their mindset for growth? Yeah, so, so to, to foster a growth mindset for you know, somebody earlier in their career, um, or for anybody, if, if, if you haven't done a lot of work on mindset, I would encourage you to, to learn about growth mindset and fixed mindset, yeah. and to reflect, we can't, what, what, when we're learning about it, we can't help reflecting on how that has affected us in our past. And we'll yeah. be able to make connections about how, a growth mindset or a fixed mindset has helped us reach our goals or, or, or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that kind of understanding of how the world works, how the mind works 
is yeah. really important. Uh, and, and it comes with a self-awareness, right, of where I am in my mindset. Like you were saying, yeah. you know, I was realizing that I was thinking that people's intelligence were fixed. That self-awareness is critical. Yeah. And then we think about how is that assumption affecting me and how is that affecting my ability to reach my goals? So yeah. all of that understanding is really, really critical uh, initial work. And as part of that work is working on trying to catch ourselves when we are in a fixed mindset real time. You know, like, oh, I am thinking in a fixed mindset way right now. Is that really a true assumption? And just, yeah. just that self-awareness is really, really fruitful work to be uh, doing early on. And then that leads to questions that leads to research and yeah. leads to building a growth mindset over time. It involves, you know, really questioning our assumptions, like is intelligence really fixed? And we might research that. Or, yeah. you know, can I really become a better singer? And if we really want to become a better singer, we can try it and figure out how do people become really good at singing? Yeah. Um, and so it is definitely a journey. It is not something that happens from one day to another. And yeah. for leaders who are leading people, I would encourage them to think about a, how they frame things, what people do when they go to work using terms like growth mindset and fixed mindset and other terms. Uh, second, what systems and habits they're fostering to foster improvement and continuous innovation. Yeah. And third, are they visibly, visibly modeling being learners themselves so that when other people uh, see them and emulate them, they're yeah. emulating the behaviors that they want to permeate the whole organization. Perfect. I've really enjoyed this chat, Eduardo. So, so how, do, how do people find out about the work you do what, in terms of websites and contact details? What's the best sure. way to point them? My, my email address is ebrisenio at mindsetworks.com. I'm in social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, and our website is mindsetworks.com. Perfect. Eduardo, it's been really great talking to you, and uh, I'd love to keep in touch. And uh, I, I feel a little bit more justified now about questioning my assumptions so i feel validated so thanks very much thank you thank you Simon. it was great to speak with you likewise bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.